Welcome to this presentation, which will be covering Chapter 11 of our textbook. Uh, the name of this chapter is Capacity and Legality. Before we actually begin on this chapter, though, let's go back to our uh, study guide, our format for this particular topic, the topic of contract formation. And we see here that uh, we started with just this amount of detail, and we have progressed to this amount of detail. So let's just do a little bit of a review before we dive into the new material. As we know, there are four elements of contracts, and you need to know this for the test, so be careful. Know what the four elements are. Um, the first element is an agreement. The next element is consideration. The third element is contractual capacity. We'll be covering this topic today. And the fourth element is legal object. We will also be covering that topic today. Uh, well, let's go back up to agreement. We covered agreement in chapter nine. And we talked about there are two elements to agreement. So when you're answering the test question, the test question is list the four elements of contract. Are you going to say offer? No, you're not. You are not going to fall into that trap. Maybe the person next to you will, but you aren't because you have been listening carefully. And you know that an offer is an element of an agreement. And an agreement is an element of contract law. An offer is not an element of a contract. It's an element of agreement. So when you list the four elements of contract, you're going to pick this one. And you're going to pick this one. And you're going to pick these two. Those are the four elements. When you get a question about what are the elements of agreement, you're going to pick this guy right here, and you're going to pick this guy right here. These are the two elements of agreement. They are not elements of contract. They are elements of agreement. Agreement is an element of a contract. So just keep those, those points straight. So for agreement, we have two elements, offer and acceptance. But then we talked that there's actually three elements for offer, and there are three elements for acceptance, and they're really parallel. This element marries up with this element. This element marries up with this element. And finally, our third element marries up with our bottom element. So they're really a mirror image of each other, which is convenient because we have the mirror image rule, which we talked about when we were covering chapter nine. Then we went on to uh, the consideration chapter, which is chapter 10, and we went through the nine rules of uh, consideration. And here are the nine rules listed. <clears throat> and now we're ready for chapter 11, <coughs> in which we're going to cover our two remaining elements of contract law. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so here we are. We've covered agreement, which includes offer and acceptance. We've covered consideration. Now we're ready for our third element, which is capacity, and our fourth element, which is legal object. So what is capacity? Well, when I think about the word capacity, my first thought is usually um, how much something will hold. What's the volume that it will hold? For example, if I have a gallon um, container for milk, say, it will hold, its capacity is one gallon. If I have a two liter uh, a Coke container, um, maybe it's empty, maybe it's full, um, how much Coke will that hold or how much water will it hold or how much sand will it hold? It'll hold, you know, two liters, that's its capacity. And that is often what we mean when we talk about capacity in everyday conversation. But when we're talking about capacity from a legal standpoint, we're using it in a different way. We're talking about ability. So here, when you think capacity, think ability. And you can see in the word capacity, you have the word capable, right? And what does capable mean? It means able. If I am capable of climbing Mount Everest, it means I am able to, count, to climb Mount Everest. But capacity isn't just about ability. There are lots of things that we may be able to do that we don't lack legal capacity to do because of this word right here, legal ability. For example, I can 
I have the ability to go down and buy some heroin if I want to. I mean, uh, I, I have money and I have the a car that will take me there and I can probably find someone who's willing to sell it to me. But that would be illegal for me to do that. So even though factually I can accomplish that task most likely, I lack the legal ability to do so because the only way I could do that would be to break the law. So when we talk about capacity, we're not just talking about practical ability, but we're talking about ability to do it within the confines of the law. So that's what capacity is. If you know what capacity is, it's pretty easy to know what incapacity is, because in English, as you know, the word, the prefix in front in means not. So if we have the word say informal, we mean not formal. If we say incompetent, we mean not competent. So if we say incapacity, we mean not capable. And of course here we have a synonym for incapacity, which is incompetence. And you can probably think for this that capacity does mean competence. That's a synonym for capacity. So when we talk about incapacity, we're talking about something that makes us unable to accomplish that task. I mean, it can be factual inability. For example, um, I can't, I am, I, I lack the capacity to go to Mars. Um, I can't do it. I lack the skill set. I lack the technology to do so. I probably don't lack the legal ability to do that, but I lack the, the factual ability to do that. So um, we can have a situation where there's actually a limitation. It could be mental or it could be physical that prevents me from doing it. But it may also be, yeah, I can actually accomplish it, just like I can probably go out and buy heroin. But I lack the capacity to do so. I am incapable or incompetent to do so in a lawful manner. But let's say tomorrow, well, let's use the example of marijuana. It, I lack the capacity to buy marijuana in Texas because that is unlawful. But let's assume that Texas legalized marijuana and the federal government legalized marijuana. Well, at that moment, I go from having the incapacity or incompetence of buying marijuana to having the capacity or competence to buy marijuana. And that changes. Now, when marijuana was illegal in Texas, did it mean I literally wouldn't be able to find it and buy it? Of course not. It's not that hard to find. But those transactions would be unlawful. So that's what we're getting at. We're not getting at factual ability, but does the law permit us to do that? Okay, so we've been talking about capacity and we've been treating it like it's an on-off switch. For example, you either have it or you don't. I either can buy marijuana or I can't buy marijuana. I can either go to the Mar Mars or I can't go to Mars. That's not entirely the way capacity works. I mean, it works a lot like an on-off switch, but it's not 100% that way. So let's talk about how we can have kind of degrees of incapacity. And really what we're talking about is whether a, a contract in which the part one or both parties lack capacity, whether it is automatically a void contract or a voidable contract. Now we talked about the differences between void and voidable contracts when we were in chapter nine. Um, I'm not gonna, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but if you need a little refresher, I would encourage you to go back to chapter nine and look at that portion of the chapter. A void contract is not a contract at all. It's an oxymoron. We're putting two terms together that can't possibly um, exist in the same uh, phrase because if it's void, it's not a contract. Um, so by definition, a void contract is in no way, shape, or form a contract, and it can't be a contract. There's nothing we can do to fix it. It is fatally broken. Um, it would be like imagining somebody who's died and they've been dead for 24 hours. We can perform CPR all day long on that person, but they are not going to come back to life. They are gone. Nothing we can do can make them come back to life, reanimate them in any way. So that's what we mean by void. It's just fatally flawed. There's just no point in even thinking about it. Sometimes when a person lacks capacity, this is the situation that he or she is in. There's just no way we can fix that problem. 
but oftentimes there is a way to fix the problem. There's a problem because after all, one of our elements of contract law is capacity. So if a person doesn't have capacity, they're missing one of the key elements, so therefore they don't have a contract. But sometimes it's, it's something we call avoidable contract, which means it's, it's not a contract exactly, but it has the potential to be treated like a contract. Okay, so um, in this situation, instead of saying the person has no capacity, we would say they have limited capacity to enter into the contract. And usually what this means is that the person who has limited capacity to enter into the contract is entitled to change his or her mind. And he or she can get out of the contract if he or she chooses to get out of that contractual obligation. Many times in these contracts, one person will have limited capacity and the other person won't have any limitations upon his or her capacity. Generally, in that situation, only the person who has some limitations on his capacity has the opportunity to get out of the contract. Um, so it can be voidable only for that person. And if, as you can see from the term voidable, it means able to be voided. But it doesn't mean it's going to automatically be voided because, again, that person with limited capacity might well say, I like this contract. I think this contract is good for me, which means they aren't going to void it. So it's going to function as a contract. On the other hand, that person with limited capacity might say, you know what? Uh, this isn't working out so great for me. I think I want out of this contract. I want to void the contract. At that time, in many cases, the contract will go poof. It's like it never even happened. That's what a voidable contract is. So let's talk about three scenarios in which a person can lack capacity or have diminished capacity. This is not an exhaustive list. These are the three big categories. So um, as we go through this, don't assume that there's no other circumstance ever in the record, records of human history where capacity uh, can, can uh, not exist and yet it doesn't fall into one of these categories. The first one is uh, probably the, the more important, most important of the three categories. This is about minority. Many times people get confused about the term minority in the law. When we use the term minority in everyday conversation, we're usually referring to someone or something that is a, a representative of less than 50% of a larger population. For example, if I were left-handed, I would be in a minority because only about 10% of the population is left-handed. Or if I had red hair, I would be in a minority because red hair is relatively uh, rare. Or say I was um, African-American. Um, in the United States, less than half of Americans are African-American, so I would be in a minority group. I would be a minority. So that's how that term is used in everyday conversation, but that's not how that term is used in the law. When we refer to somebody in their minority or somebody who is a minor, we mean somebody under the age of 18. I mean, in a way that fits with the idea of minority because in our country, most people are over the age of 18. And so it is true that people under the age of 18 are in the minority meaning they're less than 50%, but that's not actually what the term means in this sense. Even if you had an unusual circumstance wherein most of the population of the country were under the age of 18, we would still refer to that group as people in their minority. Um, we happen to use in our culture the age 18, but that's not the age that is used everywhere. In fact, it was relatively recent that um, uh, states in the United States adopted 18. It was 21 for a very, very long time. And there may even still be some states that use 21 as the break between minority and majority uh, status. Um, in Texas, it's 18, though, and you are responsible for knowing that, so do Put that away, fly, uh, flag that in your brain so you'll know that when it comes time to answer it on a test question. Generally speaking, when you are under the age of 18, um, you lack the capacity to uh, contract, to enter into contracts. But there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about those um, going forward. And the, most ex most, the best example of that is uh, people who have been emancipated in some way. Um, again, the term emancipation has um, a historical meaning, as most of us know. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that President Lincoln signed emancipated or freed slaves who were living in these southern states. 
the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which was a Reconstruction Era Amendment, um, emancipated any remaining state uh, slaves in the other states, making them free individuals. Um, uh, so when we're using the term emancipation in this context, though, we don't mean it to, to mean, hey, you're a slave until you have your 18th birthday. Obviously, that's ridiculous. But what it means is that, that a person becomes free to make his or her own choices at the age of 18. Prior to 18, they are under the supervision and control of their parent or their guardian. And so uh, that's what we use the term emancipation to refer to. And here is the actual definition. Emancipation occurs when a minor's parents or legal guardians give up their right to exercise legal control over the minor. Um, a classic way in which a person is emancipated is when he or she gets married. So if I get married when I'm 17, I become emancipated at that moment. I no longer have the disabilities of my minority. I will be treated as if I were an 18-year-old, uh, which sounds like a positive thing, and hopefully it is for that person. But uh, with becoming an adult, you get all of the, the goodies, the rights of adults, but also the responsibilities of adults. Um, and so um, it's a kind of a, a two-edged sword, so to speak. And there are other ways that a person can be emancipated. This is just one example. In addition, we have mental incapacity. This is another way that you can have a lack of capacity. We'll talk about this in more detail going forward. And we finally have intoxication. Intoxication can be um, alcohol or lawful substance like a prescription medication or an unlawful substance such as marijuana or heroin. Anything that changes your mood and makes you unable to uh, perceive a reality. So here we have a young young lad here. Obviously, he's a minor. Obviously, at his age, he can't be emancipated. Looks like he's signing a contract, but he lacks the legal capacity to enter into a contract. So let's look at minority in a little bit more um, emphasis. Um, let's look a little bit more about this 18 date here. Um, so, uh, Think back in time to when you had your 18th birthday. Maybe on the last day that you were 17, you might have stayed up past midnight, you know, kind of cheering in you, your uh, accomplishment of turning 18. Well, at 11.59 p.m. on your seven, you know, the, the last minute that you're 17, you lacked the legal capacity to enter into a contract. At 12.01 a.m., just two minutes later, you have been endowed with the ability to enter into contracts. Are you suddenly wiser? Do you suddenly have more life experience, more judgment, more discernment? No, of course you don't. You're just two minutes older. There's no dramatic change that happened to you at that point in time. It's an arbitrary standard. It's a, 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 a difference that doesn't really make a difference. And we talked about in Chapter 9 about how contract law has a fair number of arbitrary standards, uh, just cutoff points that, uh, that the, the law has developed to say, if you're on this side, this is what happens. If you're on that side, this is what happens. And they are almost always going to be somewhat arbitrary. Um, really, there's no difference between somebody who is 17 years, 364 days old, and somebody who is exactly 18 years old. We all know that, but we treat those people very, very differently from a legal standpoint. And that goes back to the idea that in the law, we know that we need to have on-off switches. It makes life a lot easier for folks if we have this. Um, if we have a hard and fast rule that everybody knows how it's going to work, it makes a lot of sense. But let's imagine for a second, let's go back to you the day before you turned 18. Let's assume for a second that you've been working for two years. Um, you've been working in an office and doing some pretty significant things, uh, negotiating contracts, um, doing some legal research, you're familiar with the laws, uh, you, uh, through your parents' account, have even done some day trading, so you're very familiar with finance and, and things along those lines. You had a checking and a savings account throughout this time. You are a very sophisticated person, much more sophisticated than most 17-year-olds, probably more sophisticated than most 25 or 30 year olds, people who are clearly eligible to enter into contracts. Well, the law doesn't care. The law doesn't say, well, 
you know, most 17 year olds, we're not going to consider adults, but this one, this one who is so sophisticated, we are going to remove the disabilities of their minority. No, that's not how it works. It's an on off switch. Um, let's flip it to another situation. Let's say you have an identical twin. Y'all both turn 18. Um, and this is the day of the 18th birthday. And uh, your twin isn't nearly as business focused as you are. He or she has never had a job. He or she doesn't have really any money, probably because they don't have a job, right? So they don't have a checking account. They don't have a savings account. They don't read the newspaper. They haven't taken any college courses. They really have very little idea about contract law or about how the economy generally works. They're not interested in the topic. You might say, well, this is somebody that we shouldn't allow enter into contracts. They don't know what they're doing. They're going to make a bad mistake. They're going to hurt themselves. Well, they may well hurt themselves. That's certainly true. But the law says, uh, this person has been alive, been on the face of the earth for 18 years. We are going to treat them like an adult. And we aren't going to apply some kind of analysis of their level of sophistication. I have heard that there are some jurisdictions, I've heard that this is true in England, that instead of having a hard and fast rule of a certain birthday in which the person is deemed to be an adult, that they do consider factors like the level of sophistication and knowledge and life experience of the person. And you can see how that would make sense in the example I just presented with the twins, one very sophisticated, one not sophisticated. But you can also see how that becomes problematic because then you're going to have to do a pretty sophisticated review of that person's life circumstances. Uh, is that really a good investment of the time of the court and the litigants? I'm not sure about that. Also, um, it makes the whole issue kind of murky, kind of gray. I mean, it's unclear now whether that 17-year-old is an adult or not. It's also unclear whether that person who's just had his 18th birthday is an adult or not. And so when you're entering into a contract, boy, that's sure information you want to have. You don't necessarily want to enter into a contract with a minor, and yet you might accidentally do so if the court does a very fact-intensive review of that person's level of sophistication instead of just looking at the birth certificate. So we have a hard and fast rule, but don't assume that every single jurisdiction necessarily has a hard and fast rule. So let's imagine we were talking before, let me flip back here, about how certain of contracts are void and certain of these contracts are voidable. Well, when a minor enters into a contract, he enters into a voidable contract. Um, so it's not as if it never happened. What it is is a type of contract that the minor has the ability to exit if he or she wishes to. And what we call this exit is the word disaffirm. They have the ability to get out of the contract, to step out of that responsibility. This is an important term. You're going to see it again on a test. So do be sure to note this and remember it for those tests. When does the minor have the right to disaffirm if he chooses to do so? Well, it needs to be after he reaches his majority, so after his 18th birthday, and a reasonable time after that. So let's say that, you know, obviously I turn 18 at 12.01 a.m. that morning. I don't have to call whomever I entered into the contract with at 12.02 and disaffirm the contract. Probably that person would be asleep anyway, right? Um, but I probably ought to disaffirm within a few days. And depending upon the fact pattern, the circumstances, I probably ought to make, make a point of doing that sooner rather than later. I probably ought not wait a week or two to go ahead and disaffirm. Um, typically, if I choose to disaffirm a contract, I'm going to have to disaffirm the entire contract. I mean, there might have been elements of the contract that I liked, but I don't get to pick and choose. It's an all or nothing situation. If we allowed the miner to pick the parts that he liked, he might say, for example, let's say he bought a loaf of bread from Kroger and he paid two bucks for the loaf of bread. He might say, well, he might bring back the loaf of bread and say to Kroger, look, Kroger, I'm disaffirming the part of the contract that makes me pay you but I'm going to affirm the part of the contract in which you give me the loaf of bread. Well, that wouldn't be very fair to Kroger, right? Kroger shouldn't be required to give people a free loaf of bread. And so it's an all or nothing type of situation. The um, newly 18 year old doesn't have to do any particular action to disaffirm. Um, it's probably a good idea to, for that person to actually put it in writing so there's no fact issue about whether a disaffirmance has happened or not. Uh, 
Of course, if the 18-year-old doesn't do anything, and especially if he continues to enjoy the benefits of that contract, then he will be treated as if he has affirmed the contract or ratified the contract, to be the better word. Um, here we go. Do I have that on the slide? I don't have that on the slide. Uh, ratification is when the, the party is saying, I've decided to stay in this contract. Um, so imagine that, again, I, I bought a loaf of bread when I was 17, say the day before my 18th birthday, and um, the next day I start eating the loaf of bread. Well, guess what? My act of eating that first piece of bread probably qualifies as a ratification. So you can see in that circumstance, I didn't have to do anything. Kroger didn't even know that I was ratifying the contract. But again, there's no particular action that has to be taken in order to disaffirm or to ratify. So let's imagine that I, the minor, choose to disaffirm my contract. Well, you know, we don't really want the, the, the newly 18-year-old person to get free stuff. I mean, that's not the goal of the whole incapacity type idea. And so we want that minor to have to make whole the other person. So again, going back to the example, let's say when I'm 17, I buy the loaf of bread. Let's say there's 20 slices in my loaf of bread and I eat five of those slices. Uh, well, I'm still 17. And so then I bring the loaf in and now only has 16 slices of bread. Well, I would need to make restitution to Kroger for the missing five slices of bread because um, I need to put the competent party, in this case the Kroger or the person over 18, back in the position that he or she would have been in if I had been an adult, if I had been in my majority at the time that I entered into the contract. Restitution has lurking in it the word restore. I am restoring or returning that person to the situation they were previously in. So there are certain contracts that a minor uh, can't void. So they aren't voidable contracts and they're not void contracts, they're just normal valid contracts. And these contracts are for things like life insurance, health insurance, psychological counseling, the performance of duties related to stock and bond transfers and bank accounts, education loan contracts, child support contracts, marriage contracts, and contracts to enlist in the armed services. You probably have seen some similarities to the items on this list. Um, you can see that once I get the benefits of life insurance, in other words, I haven't died, right? Um, it wouldn't make sense for me to be able to get a refund because if I had died um, in my minority, then the insurance company would be required to compensate me. And a similar idea is behind the health insurance situation. If I've been very healthy over that period of time and I haven't needed to go to see the doctor, uh, I'm still getting the benefit of having that coverage because no one knows what the future is going to be. And so for me to be able to get a refund because I didn't, ha I just looked at and didn't have to use it, kind of defeats the purposes of um, insurance. Psychological counseling falls into that same category. You can't really get a refund of psychological counseling. It's not something you can touch. It's not something that um, directly uh, causes you to have more stuff, but presumably it was a value to you at that time, made you maybe a happier person or a better adjusted person. We can see that down here at our end, we're talking about situations where uh, this minor has entered into adult-like responsibilities, child support. So this minor has a child to take care of. Um, giving birth or fathering a child does not emancipate a minor. The minor is still a minor vis-a-vis -vis his or her relationship with his or her parents. But the minor becomes a, a responsible adult with respect to his or her child. So it's kind of an odd situation. Let's imagine here that we have Sally and Ted. Sally is 16, Ted is 17. Uh, they become parents together. They're not married to each other. They're both single people. Um, Sally wants to uh, stay out late one night. Well, her parents say, no, you can't stay out late. You're a minor, you're living in our household. The parents have the legal right to establish curfews and things like that. Uh, Ted wants to um, 
buy a car. His parents say, no, you're not, we're not going to permit you to buy a car. You're too young for that level of responsibility. And guess what? Ted is under the age of 18. His parents can say, no, you can't do that. Um, Sally and Ted have little Bobby, their child, together. Um, uh, Sally uh, lacks the financial wherewithal to buy little Tommy's diapers, and so does Ted. Well, guess what? Uh, Sally and Ted's parents are not legally responsible for little Bobby. They may well help out, which is nice, but they are not the parents of Bobby, so they are not responsible for providing the diapers for little Bobby. It's Sally's and Ted's responsibility as little Bobby's parents. So you can see how child support contracts are contracts for people who are assuming adult responsibilities as would be a marriage contract. Similarly, enlisting in the armed services is a type of contract that assumes that you are on the verge of being an adult. Uh, people can enlist in the armed services with the agreement of their parent or parents uh, prior to their 18th birthday. So we can see how this category is because once you receive the benefit, um, you uh, you really it really can't be taken away, and these are because the person is on the verge of really becoming an adult and are is assuming adult responsibilities. These middle ones are for very sophisticated people. Um, yes, they may be children in the sense that they haven't had their 18th birthday, but they're entering into very sophisticated transactions, transactions that uh, kind of assume a level of, of knowledge and world experience that would um, incline someone to think that uh, they ought to be held responsible for those obligations. In addition, education is kind of like these other benefits you can't take away somebody's education once you've learned the stuff you know that stuff presumably forever and you can take advantage of that information as you move throughout your life and throughout your career okay so that's why most states won't allow the disaffirmance of these contracts that they're just considered valid contracts even though one of the parties lacked legal capacity so let's consider another situation sometimes I know it's gonna be shocking but sometimes minors lie about their age yes it's happened before and I don't mean just in the bar it could actually happen in a contract scenario so imagine you're again you're 17 and 11 months old and you'd really like to sign the lease on that apartment you're ready to cut your ties from mom and dad and branch out on your own you got a pretty good job you can afford the the rent and so you've decided to do that but you look pretty young still so the leasing agent says ah, Larry I'm not sure that you're actually 18 there he goes oh oh yeah yeah I'm 18 uh -huh, I sure am I had my birthday just two weeks ago sure am I am 18 Maybe Larry even has a fake ID, which he got only for the purpose of this loan, not, of course, to buy alcohol um, or to do anything else. Um, and so maybe he shows that driver's license to um, the leasing agent. Leasing agent's like, oh, okay, sure, okay, you're over 18. Awesome, wonderful. Well, of course, you can sign this lease because you are in your majority. You have legal capacity to enter into a contract. But in fact, Larry wasn't really 18. He was underage. He misrepresented his age. Now, the textbook will say under those circumstances that typically um, the minor can still disaffirm the contract. And the logic behind that is thus. Um, Minors, the reason that we cut minors slack on contracts is because they're immature. I mean, that's definitional, right? Um, they're prone to do silly, irresponsible things because they are children. That's the nature of being a child, right? And so uh, lying about one's age is a very, uh, is behavior very consistent with being a minor, making a poor choice, exercising poor judgment, telling a lie. And so it doesn't make sense really for us to say, well, because you're acting like a child, we're going to treat you like an adult. Um, and so oftentimes when a minor misrepresents his age, he's still going to be able to disaffirm the contract. But many states also provide that the competent party, the adult, can also uh, uh, 
disaffirm the contract once he or she finds out that he or she was lied to about the age of the minor. Texas has taken a bit of a different approach. Um, there's not a lot of clarity on this issue because it doesn't come up that often, but it looks like uh, Texas courts might be more likely to say no, the lying minor can't disaffirm. And you can see the argument for that as well. I mean, after all, the minor wanted to assume the responsibilities of being an adult and went to, to that action. And so really, it wouldn't be very fair for the adult, the competent person in the, the tra transaction, to suddenly be a disadvantage uh, as a result of the lying of the minor. I mean, that doesn't seem very fair either. And so at least one Texas Supreme Court case would say a lying minor cannot disaffirm. Let's talk about necessaries. Necessaries are the same thing as necessities. My guess is, if you're like me, you don't use the word necessary in this context. You use necessary as an adjective, meaning it's necessary that I file my income tax return, or um, having health insurance is a necessary asset. But when I want to use um, a, a noun for this, I'm going to say a necessity. It is a necessity that I have health insurance or it is a necessity that I have a cup of coffee in the morning or whatever. Uh, but in the law, we actually recognize that necessary can be an adjective or a noun. And necessity, of course, is a noun. So these are synonyms. They don't mean anything different. So a contract for a necess necessary is a contract for a necessity. It, it has to do with the basic necessities of life. And these are things like food, clothing, shelter, basic medical services. So imagine that you've had a quarrel with your parents. They've kicked you out of the house. You're 17 years old, but they aren't saying you can come back home. You got to sleep somewhere. You got to eat something. If you get hurt, you're going to need to go to the doctor. If you, uh, if your clothes get torn or, or uh, you, you, something happens to your clothes, you're going to need to buy new ones. And the law doesn't want you running around skin and bones with no clothes on, right? That's not a good thing. So we recognize that sometimes minors have to enter into transactions, that it's socially useful for them to do so, even though the, the particular situation they're in may be less than socially optimal. And so contracts for necessaries are considered generally they're going to be treated like valid contracts. So going back to my example of the bread that I bought in Kroger, that wasn't really the best example because after all, bread is a necessary. It's kind of a basic food item. I mean, it's not true that I have to eat bread. I might choose instead to eat um, uh, tortillas or um, rice or uh, something else. But certainly bread would fit into that category of a basic food element that would keep body and soul together, so to speak. So under those circumstances, when I'm buying a necessary, even as a minor, the courts really aren't going to let me disaffirm it because if I were allowed to disaffirm it, then uh, Kruger would be in a bind. And what Kroger might start doing, as crazy as this sounds, they might start carding people. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I'm gonna need to see an ID before you can buy this loaf of bread or this gallon of milk. Why? Why do you need to see an ID? Well, you might be under the age of 18, and we're not going to sell you that if you're under the age of 18, because you might be able to disaffirm it. Um, that sounds a little crazy, but that could actually happen. And so then you might be in an in a environment where minors can't buy, you know, toothpaste, or minors can't buy a bag of chips, or minors can't buy, uh, you know, uh, a loaf of bread. Uh, we want minors to be able to buy that, and so we don't want to put Kroger in such an awkward position that it is not going to be willing to sell the loaf of bread to minors. Now, technically, a contract for necessaries is not actually being honored. I said it was a valid contract, but that's not actually precisely true. Instead of it being a valid contract, what the court will say is, look, I mean, uh, legal capacity is missing from this contract, and we know when legal capacity is missing. Let me just go back here to our 
starting point. When we know legal capacity is missing, one of our elements of contract is missing, so we can't have a contract. But we know that we got to do something here. We can't let the kids starve in the street. And so we, we think in terms of maybe quasi-contract. Remember, we talked about quasi-contract before, promissory estoppel idea. Well, this is a different version of quasi-contract. In this example, the minor will be held to the reasonable value of the necessary, which is usually the price that the minor paid. But let me present a hypothetical situation. Okay, so I'm an unsophisticated minor. I'm 17 years old, haven't really done grocery shopping for myself. But I stumble into a Whole Foods, and let's say Whole Foods charges $10 a loaf for its bread. I mean, the bread is essentially the same bread you buy at Walmart or Kroger or Target, but Whole Foods is really proud of its loaves of bread, and it charges a lot more money for it. Uh, the miner doesn't really know much about the price of, of loaves of bread. He assumes this is a normal price, so he pays the 10 bucks. Um, he then leaves Whole Foods, and uh, the next day he turns 18. Well, before he, or I guess it celebrate his 18th birthday, he happens to stop by the Walmart, and he sees at Walmart he can buy a loaf of bread for $1. He goes, Wow! Gosh, I didn't need to pay $10 for a loaf of bread. I could have bought a loaf of bread for $1. So he buys the loaf of bread from the, from the Walmart for a dollar. Then he returns a loaf of bread to his $10 loaf of bread to Whole Foods. He hasn't opened and he hasn't eaten anything in it. Whole Foods says, well, you can't return this loaf of bread. I mean, we can't sell it now. It's been in your custody. No one's going to want it because they don't know what you've done to it. Maybe you've, you know, touched it or done other things to it and it, it could be contaminated so we're just going to have to throw it out so therefore we're unwilling to give you a refund and bread does qualify as a necessary so even though you were 17 when you bought it we consider um this a, a, a this a necessary purse purse purchase and therefore we're not going to give you any refund well that's when you say aha but i am able to disaffirm and I should only be required to pay the reasonable value of the necessary. Since I was able to find essentially the same quality item for 10% of the cost you charge, then I ought to be able to get a refund of nine of my $10 because the reasonable value of what you charged should have only been $1. Now, Whole Foods might say, well, our loaves of bread are much nicer and better than the Walmart one. They're made with organic ingredients or non-GMO ingredients or um, they're baked in, under special circumstances. So certainly uh, Whole Foods could make the argument that the reasonable value of its loaf of bread is higher than the reasonable value of the Walmart one. But you can see how now you've got uh, an argument to make at least. Okay, well, let's talk about ratification. So we talked about disaffirmance. That's when the um, former miner says, uh-uh, I'm 18 now. I don't want a part of this contract. But as we said before, that's only one option that the newly turned 18-year-old can do. Most of the time, the newly turned 18-year-old is going to ratify the contract. And he can do so. Again, ratify means to legally affirm the contract. At that moment, it moves from voidable to valid. It's just like any other contract. There used to be a hole where we talk about capacity, but now that the minor has ratified, excuse me, the 18 year old has ratified the contract, that hole gets filled in. Now there is legal capacity, so now we've satisfied all of our elements and we have a valid contract. So of course the the uh, 18 year old can do it in one of two ways through express ratification. I mean this could be uh, the same way we talked about with disaffirmance. This can be stopping by and saying to Whole Foods, "Hey Whole Foods, I have decided to ratify the purchase of that loaf of bread that I made yesterday when I was still 17." Now of course if you really did that, the people at Whole Foods would be like, "What?" What are you talking about? Because <laughs> no one really does that. People don't really go back, and you know, because obviously by the time you're 18, you've made a lot of purchases, and so it'd be pretty ridiculous for you to go back to all those stores and say, "I am expressly ratifying my purchase of these items in the past." Um, uh, but sometimes there can be circumstances in which it is useful for you to expressly ratify, and you might do it verbally, you might do it in writing. But the more likely pass is path is that you're going to ratify by implication. You aren't going to take any express action. You're not going to go to Whole Foods, but 
you're going to eat the loaf of bread. You're going to go about your life as if you are going to fully participate in that contract. That's implied ratification, and that's usually how ratification happens. Another vocabulary term you're definitely going to want to know. Okay, so sometimes people think, um, and we saw this with torts as well as with contract law, but sometimes people have this idea that parents are generally responsible for what their kids do. There is some level of responsibility that parents do have for actions of children, but generally speaking, that does not extend to contracts. When a child, and when I use the term child, I mean a minor, enters into a contract, mom and dad are not on the hook, unless, of course, they have also signed the contract. Now, of course, parents have the legal duty to provide for the basic necessities of life. We talked about this when we were talking about the issue of consideration. We talked about the pre-existing duty idea. Um, so parents are responsible for providing the basic necessities of life, but those don't extend to a car. Those don't extend to, you know, a PlayStation or something along those lines. Um, so it is true that when we're talking about basic necessities of life, if the parents are shirking those responsibilities and the child has to enter into those contracts, for example, imagine a situation where I've been kicked out of my parents' house, so I have to rent an apartment. Well, the parents might be held legally responsible for that contract because they had the obligation to provide the basic nece necessaries or necessities of life. And so their failure to meet their obligations prompted me to enter into this contract. And so a court might say that the parent is liable under the terms of the contract. That's a possible argument. But other than that scenario, generally speaking, parents do not have to satisfy the terms of the contract of their minor children. Uh, let's talk about torts. I think this is something we, we covered in, in the tort chapter, but let's uh, do a little refresher on this. Um, parents are usually not responsible for their torts of their mi minor children. Um, the minor children are responsible for the torts. Now you may be thinking to yourself, hmm, when I was a kid, I didn't really have any money. Maybe I had a little bit of allowance money or Christmas money or Hanukkah money or something like that, but um, other than those types of very pocket changey type money, I didn't have any real money. So if someone were to see me, they would have been very, very disappointed. And that's generally the answer. When a, when a minor child uh, commits a tort, there's really not a lot of, of avenues to sue that person. So let's imagine, or I'll give you an example from, from um, uh, my, my, uh, my sister-in-law's uh, life. When she was about two or three years old, uh, a child about her age, maybe a year or two older, pushed her down. And when uh, she pushed, when this bigger child pushed down the littler child, the littler child uh, lost a tooth. It was a permanent tooth. Well, I guess it couldn't have been a permanent. Maybe she had been older than that. Maybe she was six at the time. Anyway, she lost a permanent tooth. And um, she did not, you know, so she uh, was missing this tooth. But uh, the, 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 the child who might have been seven or eight did not have any um, uh, insurance didn't have any money and so there was no basis to sue that child or no I mean you could have sued the child but there would have been no recovery for suing the child so how do parents become responsible under those circumstances well the main way is through failing to properly supervise the child that can be a, a mechanism for having parental responsibility but you can see now we're not focusing upon what the child did but upon what the parent did did the parent, was the parent not watching the child appropriately? And of course, that's going to vary. If the child is two, you watch the child differently than when the child is 10. And you watch the 10-year-old differently than when the child is 17. And so the issue is, is a failure to supervise the child, did that result in unreasonable risk of harm to whomever uh, gets harmed from the child? So it's still focusing upon what the parent did, not focusing upon what the child did. So we've discussed the first of our categories of um, incapacity, the situation of a minor. And now we're going to go on and talk about mental incapacity. Okay, um, so unlike 
the minority status, unlike the people under the age of 18, where we have that on-off switch. When we're talking about mental incapacity, uh, the, you know, there is no on-off switch. I mean, once you're age 18, the assumption is you have mental capacity. Um, so there has to be, by definition, this kind of case-by-case -case analysis. So let's imagine Bob for a second. I mean, Bob is super goofy. He has always made bad decisions. He's always running out of money. He's always investing poorly. He's always getting fired from jobs for being kind of lazy and incompetent. Um, but you know what? He doesn't have any, um, he does not have an unusually low IQ. Um, and he's well over the age of 18. Um, we might look upon him and say, Bob is incompetent, the way that we use that word in everyday conversation. But from a legal standpoint, Bob is not incompetent. He is, does not lack legal capacity, in part because the bar is really, really low. It's pretty darn hard once you've turned 18 to be held to be legally incapacitated. Um, a person can have significant mental illness and still be legally capable. He can have um, a significant mental intellectual uh, disability and still have legal capacity. It's really only when the person has either because of mental illness or intellectual um, handicap that a person really doesn't understand the notion of contracts or understand, say, the notion of the future or something along those lines that he or she is going to be held to be incompetent. Um, so here we have person suffering from a mental illness or intellectual deficiency may have full limited or no legal capacity to enter into a binding contract depending upon the extent of the deficiency. Okay, and what we're going to focus on, does he understand the term, the nature and obligations of that contract? Um, obligation. Um, that person might have the, the um, intellectual capacity of a 10-year-old. We would say a person who's only been alive 10 years, the ten, the, somebody who is that age clearly um, is, uh, lacks legal capacity. But uh, somebody who is, say, 20 years old, who has the intellectual abilities of a 10-year-old, probably, or at least quite possibly, is capable because a 10 year old could understand the concept of a contract and what the obligations are. I guess that there could be an unusually complex contract that a 10 year old might not be able to understand and therefore that particular person might lack capacity with respect to that contract. If the person has this mental incapacity either because of mental illness or intellectual limitations, that contract is usually going to be voidable just like the contract entered into by somebody under the age of 18. So let's say that that person with um, intellectual limit or uh, mental health issues, for example, starts taking his or her medicine or receives some kind of treatment that remedies or lessens the severity of the disability. Well, once the disability is lifted, at least sufficiently high so that the person has legal capacity, then he or she has that window of time to decide, am I going to disaffirm or ratify that contract? just like the 18-year-old in the situation of um, minority status. And if he chooses to disaffirm it, then the contract goes away. Again, it's an all or nothing. Either take the whole contract or none of it. If, of course, the person who now has mental capacity to make the decision opts to ratify the contract, then that contract continues to be in place. You can see issues that could affect could be schizophrenia, senility, Alzheimer's disease, um, intellectual limitations, those could be factors that could cause there to be um, a lack of a legal capacity. Just like with minors, we have um, the, the exception for um, necessaries or necessities. Uh, mentally ill people and people with intellectual limitations need shelter and food and medical care and clothing just like everyone else. And so therefore, they can enter into contracts for those items for the reasonable value of those items. Now we've been saying that these contracts are, oops, I know I had it here somewhere, voidable. 
but that's not true in every situation. There is a special category of these contracts in which the, um, the contract is void, not voidable. So what do we mean by this? Well, let me just go through an example. Okay, so you have a grandfather. Unfortunately, he has developed senility. Most of the time, he doesn't really understand who he is or where he is. Um, he thinks he's in living in a different generation. He thinks his wife is still alive. Um, he is not in touch with what the current circumstances in the world are. Um, he lives in an assisted care community. Well, one day he escapes from the care community and he crosses the street and he goes over to CVS. Um, he has a little bit of money, who knows why, but he somehow or another he has some money and so he buys a, a piece of candy or something. So he uh, puts the piece of candy on the counter and he gives the clerk a dollar and the, do the clerk gives him change back and your grandfather leaves the store. Well, the grandfather under those circumstances entered into a transaction, excuse me, into a contract. Let's say he gets home and, and his mind clears a little bit. He, he now remembers who he is and what's going on, and he rises above that very low bar where he is really able to make sense of his world. He looks at the candy bar, he considers the fact that now he has 50 less cents than he did before, He's pretty satisfied with the deal. He enjoys the candy bar. He has ratified the contract. But let's say another scenario arises. He uh, looks down and he sees, oh, he has this candy bar. He has 50 cent less. He remembers, oh, I have diabetes too. I should not be eating this candy bar. So he talks to the nurse and the, they arrange for him to go back to the CVS and to return the item and to get a refund. He has disaffirmed the contract under those circumstances. So that was a voidable contract under the circumstances I listed. But let's change things up. It ends up that your grandfather has unfortunately escaped several times from his assisted care community. And for whatever reason, you continue, you're, you're the, the primary person who is, who is assisting your grandfather. You have not been able maybe to find a different place for him. And so you have decided to uh, become his, his legal guardian, maybe because you want to move him to a different facility that is going to be more secure. And so you have um, gone through the court process to actually have you, you be declared his guardian. You've um, adjudicate him as lacking capacity. So there's actually been a hearing, a court process to uh, make this establishment. And part of that process is going to be that um, there's going to be a notice published in the newspaper that says, hey, don't enter into contracts with, let's say your grandfather's name is Bob Smith, don't enter into a contract with Bob Smith because he has been adjudicated insane or whatever the, the, the term is, non complementis is actually what the term is. I don't think you need to know that for this course though. Anyway, okay, so now after you've had him, uh, your, your, this guardianship established, um, and so now all of uh, Grandpa Bob's contracts are going to be void. Well, Grandpa Bob, again, he, he enters into, again, this, this state where he doesn't really understand where he is, but he somehow manages to escape. He still has a little bit of pocket change in his pocket. He goes over to the CVS. He buys another candy bar. He takes out 50 cents from his pocket, uh, and then he leaves with the candy bar in his possession. Um, you, uh, the, 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 the assisted care facility realizes that the grandfather is gone. They contact you. You come rushing over. Grandpa is just walking back into the facility with the candy bar. You see the candy bar. Oh my gosh, how are you able to, to cross the street and buy this candy? Grandpa's pretty upset, pretty confused, pretty disoriented. Um, you uh, go over to the CVS and go, why did you sell my grandfather this candy bar? The clerk behind the counter is kind of confused. Well, I mean, he came in, he wanted a candy bar. He had the money, but didn't you read the paper? Didn't you see that it listed Bob Smith as somebody who has been adjudicated non mentis and he can't enter into these contracts? The clerk's like, what are you talking about? Uh, I don't even read the paper, and I'm pretty sure if that's in the paper, it's in a really boring section, like maybe the legal notices, and I definitely don't read those. 
the reality is that people don't read those sections. I mean, nobody reads those sections. You have to be having a pretty bad case of insomnia to stumble across those sections. So while the law assumes that everybody reads those sections, no one in fact does. But in that situation where it's been published in that way, the, um, the uh, uh, CVS entered into a void contract. There's nothing the grandfather can do to ratify the contract because he's been declared incompetent. And so because he will, he will never have that moment of being able to ratify, it's not a voidable contract, it's a void contract. So we've talked about minority status and mental incapacity. Now we're gonna talk about the third category, intoxication. So let's talk about that. Um, Intoxication tracks pretty closely with the um, mental incapacity, and you can see the connection because, again, somebody who is intoxicated is lacking the mental capacity, at least for that period of time. Um, and so in this scenario, we're going to also be making a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, we don't have a, a trigger like a birth date to tell us when the person has crossed the line or not. Just like with mental incapacity, the bar is very low. A person can be pretty intoxicated. As long as he knows what he's doing, understands he's entering into a contract, the courts are going to enforce it. This is especially true with intoxication because most intoxication scenarios are voluntary. The person is choosing to drink that much. And when they started drinking, they were sober, and so therefore they were in a position to know, hey, wait a second, if I drink this, maybe I will lack judgment, and I will maybe make some bad decisions. Oh, well, I'm going to drink anyway. So um, the courts are loath to not hold someone responsible when they've entered into those decisions. Courts are more open to holding people not responsible if the person um, maybe had an unusual reaction, for example, to a medication, um, or maybe they were slipped something, they were told it was a normal Coke, it was really a rum and Coke, or a roofie was, was put in their drink or something like that that caused them to have an unusual reaction. They were involuntarily intoxicated under those circumstances. Now we all know when people are tipsy or drunk, they oftentimes make poor judgments. That's not the standard. The standard is not, would I have made the decision if I had been cold, uh, stone cold sober? The question is, did I understand the nature and consequences of the transaction? And was I able to act in a reasonable manner in relationship to that transaction? So um, if I satisfy those, even if I'm pretty darn drunk or intoxicated or high, I'm still going to be held responsible for my contracts. Now, uh, sometimes people uh, can be really intoxicated, but they are able to kind of hold their, their themselves together and they don't necessarily appear that intoxicated. I think back to a scene from one of the um, Indiana Jones movies where um, the, the young lady is drinking in a bar with this very big, tough looking guy and they've drank a long time. And it looks like the guy is completely unaffected by all the alcohol he's drinking until he just falls over drunk. Um, there's no uh, intoxication state. He goes from being perfectly in control to perfectly unconscious. Well, obviously that's not how things like that work. He was obviously significantly compromised before, but he didn't show that. And so sometimes people are that way. If I am really intoxicated, even to the point that I don't understand my, what I'm doing, and I appear to be sober, well, the person I'm entering into the contract with has no way of knowing that I'm really intoxicated. So in those situations, courts are much more likely to enforce the contract. Because after all, it's not me, the sober person's fault that, that you're drunk. You chose to get drunk, so you ought to be held responsible for your behavior. On the other hand, if you're falling down, sloppy drunk, or you're obviously high and I enter into a contract with you and you choose to disaffirm at a later time, well, I only have myself to blame for it. I shouldn't have entered into a contract with somebody who was intoxicated, right? I certainly have some culpability under those circumstances. Just like the person who has regained his sanity or the person who's just turned 18, once I become sober, um, 
I can go ahead and either ratify the contract or disaffirm the contract. And again, just like we talked about before, contracts for necessaries will be enforced up to the reasonable value of the necessaries. So now we've gone through all the three capacities, excuse me, all the three categories of incapacity. And now we've covered agreement, which includes offer and acceptance, consideration, and capacity. Next, we'll be covering legality. But before we go to that, let's just go back to our um, slideshow here. Here we're in this um, slideshow here. So here's where we started our class today, having gone through agreement in chapter nine in pretty significant detail, then doing consideration in chapter 10. And now we're ready for the first half of chapter 11. So we have our three categories uh, that relate to contractual capacity that we're covering this class. Status as a minor, status as an incompetent person, status as an intoxicated person. Um, so at this point, we're ready to uh, uh, conclude this lecture. Our next lecture, of course, will cover the second topic in this chapter, chapter 11, which is the topic of legal object. Thanks for your attention. I hope you have a wonderful day. As always, if you have questions about this material, please send me an email, come to my office hours, or be sure to ask those questions in class. I hope this presentation has been helpful. Have a great day.